Good afternoon and welcome to the um, SBAM Daily Brief. This is Daily Brief number 22. It's April 9th, Thursday, day, 20, or day 20, uh, 17 of the Stay Home, Stay Safe order. Um, uh, again, uh, our, our effort to make sure that we have the very latest information for small businesses throughout Michigan something going on as we speak and I want to turn it to Brian who is once again in his car uh, to let us know what that is. Sure so the governor right now is doing a, a, a press conference where she is announcing the extension of the stay home order. Uh, this was not unexpected you heard us uh, talking about it earlier this week including especially yesterday saying we expected it to be extended out to uh, to May 1st or through uh, midnight April 30th and that's exactly uh, what is happening right now. Um, it, there were some that were hoping, including us, that there might be uh, a, a movement toward risk-based activity, risk assessments, so low risk things would be okay as opposed to just essential versus non-essential or critical versus non-critical. That is not happening in this order. It is essentially an extension of what is already in place with additional restrictions. So um, a, a few of those that, uh, that I know about now, uh, Micah's gonna come on, Micah Babcock, who's our um, government uh, relations director, is watching the, the press conference. He's, he's gonna uh, comb through it and give us a report at the end of our briefing. Uh, but we do know that um, they'll make clear that, uh, that in personal movements, that vacations are not okay. The, um, uh, also, um, in terms of stores, how many people can go into a store at one time, there'll be limits that are based on square footage of the store and uh, or in case of smaller uh, spaces, 25% uh, of whatever the fire code says for your location. And, uh, and they're, gonna, they're gonna make a change with uh, some uh, auto sales too. Uh, right now, there are no auto sales that are allowed. And the question came up, why can't I buy a car online? And uh, so it appears to have actually um, allowed for that to move forward. So online auto sales, but not showroom floor sales. So a couple of the things that have happened, but for the vast, vast majority of the people watching this, um, there's not a, uh, it, it's just an extension of the status quo. All right. Uh, and we'll have Micah come back on when, uh, when we know uh, if there's more detail than that. Let's focus on the uh, economic injury disaster loan. This is really one of the very first things that came out $8 billion appropriated to the EIDL loans. Um, uh, we've been sort of, we thought we had some direction from SBA um, and now there, I think there finally is some direction and it's, um, it's actually not very good news. And uh, uh, Lori, I don't mean to throw you under the bus. Uh, here for some good news, for some bad news is Lori Berman. Um, Lori, you've been monitoring this day to day uh, participating on calls every single day. Uh, what, what do we know now about the EIDL loans? Right, well, I do have some uh, disappointing news to deliver, but let's just take a step back and remind folks what the EIDL loans, the EIDL loans are. Uh, back on March 19th, our governor declared uh, Michigan uh, a, a disaster area, which was approved uh, by the White House, and the SBA ended up approving all states in the nation as a disaster area. Once that happened, the SBA system uh, really became overtaxed and flooded. So these economic injury disaster loans are to help give you capital during the COVID disaster. They were originally advertised to be up to 2 million in loans, a low cost loan fixed rate of 3.75% uh, over 30 years, with then, a possibility of a draw. So since the inception on March 19th, we've seen three different applications come through. We're finally seeing loans come through, but now we found out this morning at 8 a.m. that there's been a cap put on the amount of the EIDL loans, which still on its website says 2 million, but the cap is 15,000. That dramatically changes the loan monies that are available. It's our understanding this was done by the SBA administrator, because the response to these loans was overwhelming and they wanted to make sure that somebody got, everybody got something instead of the original that were promised. So 15,000 is that new cap. So we're, we're sorry to share that with you. It's very disappointing news. 
The other part is the recently added $10,000 grant, the $10,000 advance. We have now found out it's, it's up to, as you go through your application, at the end there's a checkbox that says, would you like to be considered for that up to $10,000 grant? We've now found that that advance is based on your number of FTEs, your number of full-time employees times $1,000. So if you're a sole proprietor and it's one employee, you will get a thousand back. And that's the standard behind how they are giving away those grants. We believe people have been approved. Well, we know people have been approved starting over the weekend. And I'm sorry if there are folks that have been approved for more than 15,000. The SBA could not tell us today if they would receive the promised amount or if they would be limited at the cap. So those of you that have been approved at a higher rate, I'm sorry, but you're just going to have to wait. Uh, we don't know at this point what you're getting. Uh, for those of you that haven't applied, still do apply. If you need that low cost uh, rate, it, you know, it's there. Um, certainly an option to get funding while you are in this uh, economic experience at the moment. So I just want to make sure that, you know, there's so much moving right now. We are not talking about the Paycheck Protection Program. This is not the PPP. This is the original uh, EIDL loans that were talked about up to two million dollars, uh, low interest, uh, uh, you know, uh, very good terms. Yes. Um, you know, I, I think part of the challenge we have in trying to just make sure you have the latest information is we gave that to you from the from the law, what what was actually passed by the Congress, the amount of money and the rules passed by the law. Brian, we've we've seen the seen the uh, the goalpost move so many times as this thing is implemented and uh, what in the world is going on in Washington that makes this um, such a moving target? Rob, when, when we saw that Secretary Mnuchin took the Paycheck Protection Program Administration, the rules drafting away from the SBA, from the Small Business Administration, now, I always want to point out that is not us. We are the Small Business Association, not the Small Business Administration. Uh, the Small Business Administration, uh, they, they normally do the rules for things. Secretary Mnuchin took away the Paycheck Prote Protection Program rulemaking and did it himself and within uh, the Department of Treasury. We didn't know at the time how important that was because the Small Business Administration has been on this other program, EIDL loans that they run, um, have really been not just changing the rules, but completely pulling the rug out from underneath people. Um, I, 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 it's, it's strange for me to say that the, the, the person running the IRS, Steve Mnuchin, has been the best advocate for taxpayers and small business owners than we could have ever, ever asked for, and probably in the whole executive branch of the federal government, just such a strong, strong advocate. And the Small Business Administration keeps on changing the rules and pulling out the rug from people. So um, we're, we're, to say we're disappointed is, is an understatement. Um, thankfully, though, the, the Paycheck Protection Program is, 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 uh, re it remains and is, is moving forward as we were expecting it to. Uh, more banks coming online. Um, but that uh, everything from the, the $10,000 advance to the $2 million total amount that somebody could borrow, uh, those are things that the $2 million amount, that's been in place for a long, long time. Not just for this Michigan disaster, but that tool, the EIDL loans, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, those, um, those are tools that are used in disasters all over for the history of our, our country, all over our country. And uh, they changed it just now for this one. And, um, and then the, uh, the $10,000 advance, you know, they, they advertised that. Really what Congress said was, if you're going to get one of these EIDL loans, on the front end, we're gonna give you $10,000. And it always said up to $10,000. And, um, and it, was just, uh, it was just surprising to hear them say, well, it's gonna be limited to 1,000 per employee. And since you can't have that forgiven and the pay, paycheck protection loan forgiven at the same time, you get one or the other. Um, well, it makes it kind of a, a useless tool. Like, why would you want to get 1,000 per employee when you could get 100% of 
of uh, of a payroll or for two and a half months, you know, uh, 250% of average monthly payroll. That's what the Paycheck Protection Program does. So that's really the that's really the tool. I mean, it it's not that you can't or you shouldn't. I mean, if you have some extra time, go go and get an EIDL loan if 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 you'd like. But the Paycheck Protection Program is is now um, it, it's really now the centerpiece of the response. So I, I think it's important. We've said this along the way that we are not just reporting what's going on. We're actively involved in the conversations and we're an advocacy organization. We fight for small businesses. We, we advocate on their behalf. Uh, this is one of those times when I think it's, it's not just, um, it, it's not enough for us to just uh, listen to what they're saying and pass that along. Um, I, I believe that the SBA management in DC, and I'm not talking about the SBDC program in, in Michigan or even the SBA office in Michigan, but the SBA management in DC has done a major disservice to small business. And whoever thought you'd be saying that? Um, and so we will be talking to our congressional delegation, we'll be talking to uh, the people that, that uh, whose, whose ear need to hear this, but that is, um, you know, Brian, when you use the term pulling the rug out from underneath small businesses, the last place you expect that to happen is from the SBA. But that's yeah, clearly I mean, what's been going on. It's so ironic. The, 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 the heroes to, to small business have been the IRS and the small business administration or yeah, small business administration has been the ones that it's been so hard to, to deal with. And uh, it just could not be more disappointed. All right, let's, uh, let's turn our attention to the PPP. I think in, in, in perspective, this is the bigger help. It always, it's always been the bigger help. Uh, we're hearing lots of companies now who have been approved for funding. I don't know that I've talked to anyone who's actually gotten money in their bank account yet, but certainly we know that approvals are happening. Um, and we've been talking about things that are that, you know, happening across banking in our state. What's, what's the latest on the PPP? And uh, tomorrow is kind of a big day because it's the day it opens for sole props, 1099s, independent contractors. Uh, and uh, I guess the question is, are, are we ready? Yeah, so the, the, it's been building all week. We have asked our members to let us know when they start getting approvals and when they start getting uh, loan closings set. So a, a, a few things, first is, more and more banks and credit unions are coming online now. So we've seen um, a lot of different banks showing up in our, in our email box and our feed from our members saying, my, my approval came in from this bank, my approval came in from that bank. Uh, we're even seeing a few banks that have worked through most of their existing customer base and now they're open for non-customers. So that's a big change too. Um, it, now it doesn't mean that they're gonna go too far outside of their normal market, uh, but uh, but that's a dynamic change that is really important. Um, the um, the other thing I want to point out is that there is a requirement that when you you'll get that SBA approval, you got to close the loan within ten days. And um, we we we've talked a little bit about this. What if somebody wanted to wait or push it off? Some um, the purpose of this is is not coordinated. The feds are not coordinated with the state reopening. That's not what this is. That's really not what their purpose is. The feds are looking for you to keep your people on your payroll at all costs. Uh, uh, not just like even though you're not opened, but they they want you to keep on your payroll because you're not opened. Because those employees wouldn't have any other income other than unemployment. Um, so. What they're looking for is when we're closed down, that's when they want them on your payroll. So they're not going to let you wait in a, a month before you um, uh, before you um, you bring them back on your payroll and get their forgiveness aspect of this loan. Uh, tomorrow is the date that uh, the original rule said that sole proprietors and independent contractors, the self-employed, um, can uh, can uh, file for a. a PPP loan, a Paycheck Protection Program loan. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about this because I, I haven't seen specific rules come through that said here are how they're going to calculate everything. Um, it doesn't mean that some banks don't have those in their hands or they haven't still built a system. Um, but uh, but according to the original schedule, sole proprietors and 1099 contractors, independent contractors, should be able to file for a PPP starting tomorrow. 
Okay. The other thing we've been talking about is, you know, the, the, the sort of sense of urgency that we've been building because 350 billion, the original amount appropriated by Congress, uh, our sense was simply wasn't going to be enough. And I think we, we've, been, uh, we've been right about that. Uh, although, um, you know, the, the, the money, I think because the, the approval process has taken a little bit longer, there, it hasn't run out at this point, uh, almost a week into it. But we've been also suggesting or, or you know, watching what the Congress conversation going on in the Congress that uh, there may well be some additional money coming through. $250 billion is the amount that they're talking about. Um, and I think you and I both have been feeling good that this was going to happen. Hit a little snag today. Are you still feeling good about this or, or how are you feeling about it? Well, I'm not feeling as good as I was yesterday. Um, everybody has known that there's a phase four coming on the stimulus and it's gonna deal with hospitals and state governments and local governments. And, and it was always thought that that would maybe include uh, some of the resources for um, additional resources to replenish the Paycheck Protection Program. The, um, but because it was feared that the Paycheck Protection Program would run out so quickly, demand was so high that there was an effort to, to go ahead and just pass just that really quickly. And they can do it if the, with unanimous consent. In other words, if nobody uh, objects, no senator or no congressman objects, they can just send it straight to the president's desk. So there was a hope that that would happen. And, um, and, and unfortunately, it got, it got hung up today. Uh, Democratic leadership in the, um, in the House and the Senate are asking for additional things. They don't want just the, the Paycheck Protection Program money to go through. Um, they want it, first of all, they want some of that money to go to something else, not paycheck protection. And they also want other things added on. Um, do we have Micah on? Because he, he actually uh, tracked this down and kind of did an, an itemization of what, um, of, of what the Democrats in the Congress were asking for. Micah, are you, are you there? Yeah, I am, Brian. So a few of the Democrats, it kind of seemed they wanted to combine those two packages you've been talking about. So the, the Republicans out there have been focusing on getting uh, some assistance to small businesses right now out of the gate, especially with them coming uh, up to kind of a, a session break as well in the Senate, too. Um, it, it seems like the Democrats are really trying to cram some more um, you know, assistance into this package now rather than waiting uh, you know, maybe a week or two in order to discuss that second large stimulus package. So it's, um, what was the, uh, the 250 billion that, um, that um, Steve Mnuchin was talking about and the vice president the other day for paycheck protection, um, there, was, uh, there was some proposal put on the, day to, uh, on the table today to maybe take half of that money and put it toward some other kind of business lending. Could you maybe uh, touch on that? Yeah, so they discussed as well, the Democrats would like part of that 250 million, about half of it to go specifically to um, local foundations and local groups to do lending towards specific minority, um, women owned, uh, veteran owned um, businesses and things of that nature as well. So I, I, the reason why this is, um, it's, this is gonna create a little bit more time is because um, that, Delivering money quickly before in the Paycheck Protection Program, even though it was a new program, they used an, an existing infrastructure for it. So um, that was, uh, it was, you know, it's been real bumpy and, and uh, everybody's kind of been afraid because they did it in one week. Uh, what makes me nervous about what they're talking about now is sending the money through distribution channels that don't normally do loans. And how long will it take to, to do that and how will it, will it be done? Um, right now, they go through SBA certified lenders. And, um, and so that, that existing lending infrastructure is strong. Um, so that, I don't, I don't know how long a delay that this will be. And um, it, it doesn't mean that the goals aren't noble that they're trying to achieve here, um, but it, it does put some timing question marks in it that, that weren't apparent yesterday. So, so Brian, let's just, in, in thinking about the Paycheck Protection Program, and again, now people are beginning to get a word that they've been approved, and a couple hundred billion has been accounted for at this point. Um, 
you know, we, we've been trying to help people think about their strategy for using this. And, you know, just, just talk a little bit about how people might want to think about it, or what the intent is. And if you know the intent, how you might want to think about deploying that money and when and how. The, the main thing is that you got flexibility in how you use the money, but if you want them if forgiven, if you want to not have to pay it back, that's when you have to follow some very particular rules. And, uh, and so one of the questions that, or one of the decisions you have to make is are you gonna call people back from layoff? And, um, and the legislation clearly is trying to incentivize you to do that. So what they want is for people to go off unemployment and back on your payroll, even if you don't have work for them. And, uh, and so if you do that and you do it for the minimum, at least a minimum period of time, which is eight weeks, then um, you, it may or may not be time to get back into business here in Michigan. We, we don't have a good way. I wish we had a better sense for that. I wish I could express confidence that at the end of eight weeks, uh, you're going to be back in business or at least some uh for in some way I, I can't provide that type of uh confidence at this moment but the the purpose of the paycheck protection program was to keep people on payroll during this time um it was it has been suggested by other members of, of congress that they imagined eight weeks would be enough that what they wanted to do was get through this whole thing and um and if they need to do the the attitude has been whatever we got to do we're going to do if we need to do more, we'll do more. Um, we've seen plenty of evidence, but what we also see is that, you know, these things can get complicated as they move through Congress. You might recall that when uh, Bill Heis Congressman Bill Heisinger was on um, Saturday before last, um, he said that that's often what happens is that the House had a $800 billion package and the Senate had a $800 billion package and they compromised and did $2.2 trillion or $2.3 so, um, so that's the um, that's probably what's going to happen here. And for those of us who you know pay attention to these things, I don't know what the limits are and how much they can spend. And before you know, before the the country runs out of credit, but their attitude certainly has been: if eight weeks isn't long enough, then we'll revisit and see what else we have to do. So, to this very point, um, we have two webinars uh, that we're working on for next week. One of them is set. It is. Tuesday at 10 a.m. It's on spending and tracking your PPP. So if you have, or if you expect to be approved for PPP and you need to now begin to think about how, again, I'm gonna deploy that money, what's my strategy and tracking it so that it's forgivable and you're certain of that, you have, have certainty of it. Um, we're doing a webinar 10 a.m. Tuesday on spending and tracking your PPP. Uh, and we're working on one for the tax implications of both the EIDL and the PPP uh, and layering those two together. So uh, that's either, um, it'll be later next week and we'll talk about it in, in future uh, daily briefings. Micah, now that you're here, you've heard um, specifically what the governor talked about. Brian previewed it a little bit as an extension uh, to April 30th or May 1st. Um, what what else did we hear about the uh, executive order uh, being extended today? Yeah, Brian, so, uh, or Rob, sorry, <laughs> just as you said, uh, she's doing the press conference right now, extended those guidelines, the stay home, stay safe guidelines to April 30th. Um, she mentioned just briefly here, as of today, we have in Michigan 21,504 positive cases and have lost uh, 1,076 individuals across our entire state. <laughs> Um, most of this is familiar to many of you, uh, of the businesses, but she did, uh, kind of discuss briefly, um, a few limitations that I do want to mention here. Um, so she did mention that gatherings of any size are prohibited and that she is going to start imposing more stringent limitations on stores that have foot traffic and limiting the foot traffic in a specific retail stores, as well as shutting down in, in, uh, stores such as, a uh, you know, Meyer shutting down their non-essential sections. So you won't be able to go and buy furniture or um, uh, you know, possibly some landscaping materials, um, shutting down those non-essential areas of, the, of these stores that are open. As well as, like, like I said, limiting the amount of people in the store. She, she briefly mentioned some guidelines on how many customers per square foot 
as well as for some smaller stores limiting their occupancy by, by about 25%. So we'll be sure to get that information out to everybody when she releases it in paper uh, format there. Um, but, but it was concerning. Also, she briefly mentioned too that the, these stores that have foot traffic right now that they need to establish lines that they can stand the safe six feet distance apart. Um, um, from each from the customers and individuals in the store. So that's kind of the brief update I got now, but uh, I'm sure she'll be following up that press conference with a handful <laughs> of uh, materials and print and things like that that we'll be able to circulate. Them. So I would say um, the, the um, shutting down the sale of non-essential items inside a store is an interesting issue for us. And that is to say, we've had a number of members say, I sell landscaping supplies or I sell puzzles, but my store is closed and you can go to Meyer and buy anything that I sell, uh, but I have to be closed. And, and, and so while I don't think the public is going to like that very much, closing off entire sections, I do think it's a, uh, it is a response to a fairness complaint from small businesses who find themselves frustrated that the big guys can continue to sell what they sell and they cannot. Um, so uh, it's been an interesting journey for us and our, our, I'm, you know, I'm, in part, I'm, I'm happy that she's been responsive to that voice and that complaint. Although I, I should point out that we also heard from people that sell into those stores that it was, was the last glimmer of hope that they had that they could survive and now it's being snatched away. Yes. So, it just shows how, how tightly we are, um, we are all intertwined. And when you start pushing down dominoes, they just keep on falling. And uh, so you know, we, we are naturally very, very concerned with the, um, just the, the how, how we know that we have a resilient economy. It has been going strong for a long time, but is it resilient to survive um, this period of time? And, um, that's, that is very much yet to be, be determined. So I think it's important, you know, we started yesterday with Senator Shirky um, talking about the bipartisan uh, group of senators that he's convened uh, to talk about, to, you know, this parallel conversation about how do we end this? When do we end it? What are the, what are the rules of the road to come out of this? Uh, I think it's important for, um, for, again, our members and small businesses to understand that we have been a part of that conversation uh, and we continue to be through the chairman of our board, Milan Gandhi, who is a part of a sort of informal group that's been called together uh, to, to hear from the business community. Uh, and, and Milan sits uh, at, at the table with, uh, with other businesses uh, and, and I think has, you know, obviously uh, being at the table is an important thing. Tomorrow, Millen's gonna come on and, and join us and talk a little bit about just what is the conversation and, and um, how do we continue, how do we put pressure where it's appropriate? How do we lobby this, if you will, uh, and uh, be, be part of a constructive conversation about how we get back to work and back, back in business. Um, tomorrow's briefing is actually going to be at one o'clock. Tomorrow's Good Friday, and in respect for that, um, we're going to move from three o'clock to one o'clock tomorrow. We'll be back to our regular three o'clock briefing time next week. Um, so I um, hope you'll join us tomorrow at one o'clock. Uh, in the meantime, uh, just remember, wash your hands. And don't touch your face. Good luck. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>